Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome uh, back to Rocky Mountain Readings, where last week we uh, finished off a wonderful uh, book uh, on the golem and the wondrous deeds of the Maharal of Prague, and that was a very exciting uh, uh, story. But today we're going to break into a new book and uh, start into something real exciting. Uh, the book that we're uh, going to start is called The Gaon of Vilna and His Messianic Vision uh, by Dr. Ari Morgenstern. And, um, if you're not familiar with, uh, Dr. Morgenstern, uh, just give you a little bit bio on him. Uh, Dr. Morgenstern is a senior fellow at the Shalom center in Jerusalem. He received his PhD in modern Jewish history from the Hebrew university in Jerusalem. His research specialties include messianic movements and in the 18th and 19th centuries, Dr. Morgenstern studied for many years in Israel yeshiva, including Ye uh, Ye uh, Yeshivat uh, Hevron in Jerusalem. He's the author of seven books as well as many other scholarly articles. His previous book in English is entitled Hastening Redemption, Messianism, and the Resettlement of the Land of Israel. Uh, that one was by Oxford uh, University Press in 06. Uh, Well-respected uh, 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 doctor, Shalom, Ashley G. Always good to have you with us, and uh, we hope we uh, keep giving you exciting uh, uh, works to consider. So, uh, yeah, we're going to jump into this wonderful book. Now, just for those of you who have been following along, uh, we covered that uh, uh, the Golem book in just four sessions. This book, uh, uh, unlike that one, is about three-quarters the size of what the um, – that huge book we did uh, uh, by the Rambam, uh, the guide for the perplex. This is about three quarters of that size, so this is probably going to take us about twenty to twenty-five sessions. Shalom, Sheila. Glad to have you with us as always. So, yeah, uh, this is going to be a long and in-depth book by a wonderful uh, uh, PhD historian from Jerusalem, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you can pick up some uh, uh, wonderful thoughts uh, uh, about. Uh, a messianic vision. So, uh, yeah, let's jump right into it and uh, see what we can cover. Okay, so we're going to start with the preface. This book, dealing with Jewish messianism in the 18th century, is based on discoveries originating in hitherto unknown documents that were buried in archives across the former Soviet Union, documents that, due to the democratization process that took place in those centuries became accessible to Western and Israeli scholars in the past 20 years. These archives were found to contain collections of individual documents, community records from the 18th and 19th century, files from the Ministry of Interior and the Police Department, intelligence files in Tsarist Russia Army and Karite uh, sources. Together, they cast Eastern European Jewry in a new light. Now, this almost sounds similar to the way that the Golem book started out, but these have never been uh, uh, denied as uh, history, whereas in the Golem, the, the discovered documents mentioned there may never have uh, ever existed. So uh, this is something to keep in mind. Concurrently, the, the copious archives of Western European Jewish communities that survived the Holocaust were opened after a lengthy process of sorting and recording. These archives, including uh, troves from Amsterdam, The Hague, Venice, uh, Liv Livnor, and uh, Treaties, uh, Trieste, prove to contain huge quantities of important and previously unknown documentary material. These diverse collections contain, among other things, documentation about relations between Jewish communities in Eastern and Western Europe, their internal relations, and relations between them and the Jews in the land of Israel. They also recount attempts by rabbis and Kabbalists to reveal the timing of messianic redemption by interpreting codes embedded in scripture and records records their taking various mystical actions to hasten the redemption using practical Kabbalah or mystical practices, searching for the lost 10 tribes and making Aliyah immigrating to the land of Israel. Extensive use of this new documentation backed by published sources hitherto ignored by researchers have allowed us to establish a platform of historical events uh, and to understand the covert ways in which they interrelate. One of the new lessons that this material teaches is that the historical events mentioned in these sources have a messianic interpretation and signif significance that fit into the awakening and acute expectation of redemption that were invinced uh, in the 18th century Jewish world. 
The research effort that underlies this book was performed under the auspices of the, the Denur Center for Research in Jewish History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was expressed in final form in 1997 at a research seminar on Jewish history at the Institute for Advanced Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Shalom, Zakia. Glad to have you with us. Since 1997 also marked the bicentennial of the death of the Gaon of Vilna, I took the opportunity to reveal for the first time in lectures in various Israeli academic, academic settings the discoveries that are described at length in this book. On August 5, 1997, I lectured at the 12th World Congress of Jewish Studies on a new approach toward the question of messianic tendencies at the dawn of Hasidism. Uh, on December 30th, 1997, I delivered the keynote address at the International Conference of Historical Societies for the Study of Jewish History on the persona of the Gaon of Vilna in light of new sources. On January 7th, 1998, I lectured at a symposium at Bar Ilan University on the Gaon of Vilna's messianic goal to be the final uh, codifier. I committed to writing my main findings about the Gaon of Vilna in two publications, an essay titled An Attempt to Hasten the Redemption, published in the United States in Jewish Action, and an article titled The Gaon, Rabbi Elijah of Vilna, uh, and His Historical Influence, uh, which appeared in the collection of the Gaon of Vilna, The Man and His Legacy, in Tel Aviv in 1998, published on the occasion of a bicentennial exhibition on the Gaon held in Tel Aviv at Bet uh, Hatafushos, the Nahum Goldman Museum of the Jewish Diaspora, for which I was the academic advisor. This book was originally published in Hebrew under the title Mysticism and Messianism from Luzado to the Vilna Gaon, Jerusalem, 1998. The appendices of the Hebrew edition include uh, uh, facsimiles of 18 documents in manuscript form that were found in the aforementioned archives. This edition of the book, however, omits these documents and illustrations. As well, the English edition does not include the chapter on Eastern European Aliyah in the years 1764 to 1776, and instead adds a chapter dealing with the search for the ten tribes in the 18th century. I extend my thanks to uh, Mr. Naftali Greenwood for his excellent English translation and to Mrs. Sipora Levine, for her superb editing of this work. It is also my pleasant duty to thank the staff of the libraries and archives in Israel and abroad for having allowed me to pursue their hidden treasures and to extract valuable source material from them. I also express my gratitude to my friends, scholars Yosef Avivi, David Asaf, uh, Mir uh, Benayahu, uh, Yeshayahu, Yahu, uh, Winograd, uh, Moshish Halamish, uh, Ye Yehoshua uh, Monshine, David uh, Kamenensky, and Shaul Stamfer, who happily lent me their generous assistance. Last but most emphatically not least, I, I thank my dear wife, Rachel Lee, who, enriched with sound and sagacious advice of all phases of my work, from gathering the material to the final edit. Above, women in the tent shall be she be blessed from Judges 524, and that was written by Ari Morgenstern, Jerusalem, spring 2012, when this book was published. So, yes, it sounds like an exciting uh, uh, and deep uh, venture for sure. Introduction, Belief in the Redemption After the Sabbatean Crisis. One of the most uh, fateful historical episodes in Jewish history, one that left its imprint on all of the Jewish history in the modern era, unfolded in the second half of the 17th century. Riding atop the infrastructure of the Jewish messianic belief and the everlasting hope for redemption, and abated by the persecutions of Eastern European Jews in 1648 to 1649, the Sabbatean messianic movement burst upon the Jewish world. Uh, the movement first began to grow in Eretz Israel, Shabtai Zvi, the self-proclaimed Messiah, was banished from his hometown of Izmir and came ashore in Jaffa, uh, where the Kabbalist Nathan of uh, Gaza joined him and strengthened him in his messianic pursuits. The two of them went on to Jerusalem where, despite the opposition of the local rabbis, they and a clutch of associates performed mystical rituals that were meant to demonstrate that Shabtai Zvi was indeed the Messiah. 
1665, pursuant to the rumors from Israel, a mass repentance movement began to spread across the entire uh, diaspora. Miracle stories about the wondrous feats of the Messiah, Shabtai Zee, sparked messianic ecstasy and massive displays of passion that included preparations for immediate aliyah. The fervor gripped all tiers of Jewish society, uh, from rabbis and eminent religious scholars to common folk. The eruption of messianic excitement, however, began to ebb in early 1666 when the Ottoman authorities arrested Shabtai Zvi for sedition. When the would be Messiah converted to Islam due to fear for his life. The passion petered out entirely. Uh, for the overwhelming majority of Jews, Shabtai Zvi relation. Revelation as an apostate Messiah marked the tragic end of the affair. His intimate followers joined him in converting to Islam. Others, however, continued to believe in him as the Messiah and explained his conversion as an act meant in accordance with the outlook of Lurianic Kabbalah to raise the holy sparks that had been imprisoned in Islam. Some believe that Shabdai V would reveal himself again in the Eretz Israel in 40 years' time, and several individuals who adopted this view even moved to Israel in anticipation of the re-revelation of the Messiah in 1706. Some scholars considered the Aliyah in 1700 of Judah Hasid of uh, Shidlitz, along with several hundred uh, uh, fellow Olam immigrants, uh, as evidence of their the persistence of the Sabbatean movement. The purpose of their act these scholars believed was to greet Shabtai Zvi upon his second coming. If so, they failed and quickly disappeared, leaving behind the physical destruction of the Ashkenazi courtyard in Jerusalem, where they had dwelt and a pungent sense of spiritual failure that spread throughout the land of Israel and the diaspora. Ben Zion Diner, however, took issue with this theory. He believed that the Aliyah of Judah Hasid attests mainly to the per, uh, persistence of the traditional messianic tension, the continued drive to force the end, and the, char the charting of a realistic course of messianic action and self-awakening for redemption that has nothing in common with Sabbateanism. A re-examination of the archival sources that this Aliyah movement left behind, however, suggests that both goals were being pursued uh, concurrently, i.e., the group included both Sabbatean and fierce anti-Sabbateans. The latter were Lurianic Kabbalists who moved to Israel in the expectation of an imminent redemption that would begin in the year 1740. The former were Sabbateans who awaited the return of their Messiah in 1706. Those who left willingly or by expulsion were the Sabbateans. The Lurianic Kabbalists, in contrast, remained in Jerusalem despite the many hardships of life there. And some uh, resettled in Sfat uh, in 1720 after the destruction of the Ashkenazi courtyard in Jerusalem. The motive uh, for the early 18th century Aliyah is difficult to identify due to the crisis of faith that followed the failure of the Sabbatean movement and the ruthless persecution of such Sabbateans as remained. Fear of the, the pernicious influence of the Sabbateanism became rampant. In the resulting climate, the struggle against anyone suspected of Sabbatean learnings knew no limit, uh, manifesting itself in the settling of personal scores in the denun denunciation of suspects to the authorities. Uh, these several persecutions also threatened Jewish scholars of the Kabbalistic persuasion. To escape the witch hunt, many of them preferred to refrain from expressing their views on the topic of messianic faith in its traditional legitimate form. Even those who dared to commit their thoughts uh, to writing did so cautiously and vaguely, avoiding any definitive statements. This phenomenon caused immeasurable damage to the research in that era. An example is the persecution of Moses Chaim Luzato, the Ram Khal, uh, and the excommunication that rabbis in Italy pronounced upon him. Luzato's social milieu uh, could not digest his spiritual intensity. And I love the Ram Khal's material. Because he had strayed, well, they say they see he had strayed from the accepted path. Ramkel was uh, suspected of Sabbateanism and hounded unjustly by zealot, zealous extremist rabbis. He was enjoined against studying and teaching Lurianic Kabbalah. 
His books were confiscated, burned, and buried, and the result was a loss to the spiritual history of the Jews and, in turn, to research in that era. Um, Jacob Emden's uh, splenetic war on Jonathan uh, Ibeschutz, uh, whom he accused of Sabbateism, also caused harm, even though important historical documents about the history of Sabbateanism and the understanding of its outlooks were published in the aftermath of this struggle, there is no doubt whatsoever that Emden, widely known as a contentious and quarrelsome person who did not, uh, who did not hesitate to besmirch and malign his rivals, deterred many from publicizing their writings and views due to the fear, their fear of his obsessive persecution. Samuel B. Eliezer, author of uh, Dark Nay, Noam in uh, Konigsberg, uh, 1764, and a contemporary of the Vilna Gon, explicitly declares the tremendous damage that Sabbateanism and its offshoots inflicted on the study of Kabbalah in his generation and claims that religious scholars avoided such study lest they be falsely accused of Sabbateanism. Uh, Chaim Joseph David uh, Azule, the Hida, describes uh, the pervasiveness of this kind of thinking among the Sephardim in, Arad, in the land of Israel, who were afraid of being accused of Sabbatean learnings in campaigns of uh, calumny and defamation. The upshot of these remarks is that whenever one wishes to describe Jewish history in the post sabbatean era, Era, one must carefully examine the con contemporaneous sources for any linguistic allusions that they may contain. To capture the reality as it, is, as it really was, one should consider the available historical sources and, and explore their veiled references in view of the zeitgeist and the constraints under which the writers labored. Historians should bear in mind that these writers did not say everything that they thought did not write everything that they said, and did not publish everything that they wrote. Even their published writings must be studied with painstaking care, since they conceal more than they re reveal. The great question that surfaced in the aftermath of the Sabbatean crisis was this. Had the crisis extinguished the messianic belief and the unwavering expectation of redemption that the Jews had entertained ever since the destruction of the temple? Or would traditional Jewish society give birth to internal forces that would surmount the crisis as had happened before? As it transpired, despite the grave delusionment and trauma that the Sabbatean crisis had inflicted, the instances of conversion to Islam and Christianity and assimilation and apostasy on the fringes of the camp, the messianic hopes of the Jewish masses survived unscathed. Not only had the powerful messianic energies that were manifested during Shabtai's V time not dis dissipated, they actually gathered momentum. In their aftermath, a new awakening for redemption ensued in the 18th century. From then on, Lurianic Kabbalah became the main messianic doctrine among Jewish mystics. According to this doctrine, the human and the celestial worlds are mired in a crisis that developed after the vessels of the world of Tohu or chaos were shattered, causing the sparks of holiness to descend into shells. It is the Jewish people's function to make these sparks once again ascend once again, thereby restoring the original equilibrium of the system. Extracting the sparks alternatively, expressed as in Lurianic process of tikkun or repair or burium sortings, encompasses all areas of life and is not confined to study of Torah and Kabbalah, prayer, and the observance of uh, mitzvot. Any human action in any areas of life, if performed with positive intent, allows the Lurianic tikkun process to be carried to its conclusion. Some Kabbalists of the time continued to insist vehemently that the redemption was imminent and that one needed only to find new ways to assure its fulfillment. In their opinion, the failure of the Sabbatean movement meant only that means that the means that had been adopted had failed. The failure of that means, they continued, does not discredit the belief in imminent redemption, let alone the truth of the messianic conviction. Therefore, other ways of hastening the redemption should be sought. From then on, the Kabbalists were no longer satisfied with the long-accepted method of hastening the redemption. 
meticulous observance of commandments, mitzvot, they uh, augmented this imperative by demanding that the, the uh, mitzvot be observed not by rote, but with the embellishment of mystical uh, kavanot or intentions. And through other spiritual actions that facilitate cleavage to Hashem, the same applied to the study of Torah. Study of the revealed Torah, the Kabbalists argued, cannot bring forward the redemption by itself. The realization of the redemption hinges solely on the study of esoteric Torah, the inner Torah, the true Torah. This outlook on the importance of Kabbalah made steady inroads in the middle of the 18th century, even beginning to crowd out study of the Talmud and the rabbinic literature, including works of halakha ruling. You can see why the Ram Kal began to write what he wrote in that environment, for sure. Um, turning people's minds back to uh, true ethical studies. Uh, the attitude toward prayer as an important vehicle in the service of Hashem also changed. Kabbalists argued that prayer without mystical uh, intent, especially those prescribed by Isaac Luria, cannot bring about a change in reality. Thus, the right way to pray, like the right way to observe the, the mitzvot, is followed is by following the practices and intent established in by Isaac Luria. Therefore, some Kabbalists preserved in their attempts to affect reality in the new ways by studying uh, Kabbalah, inserting mystical uh, intent into their prayers and their observant of the commandments, isolating themselves and adopting ascetic practices. Some took more extreme steps in their efforts to hasten the redemption such as attempting to attain unifications or a sense of the soul and cleavage to Hashem. Another outlook was typical of post sabbatean era argued that religious perfection, a state that could hasten the redemption, cannot be attained outside the land of Israel. And though the efforts of individuals, however pious and righteous they may be, but only by the gathering of such individuals into group settings. The, the idea was to establish mystical groups that would achieve fraternity and unity, observe the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself in a genuine manner, and engage together in study of Torah, the study of Kabbalah and mystical practices. The members of the society were to make up for each other short make up for each other's shortcomings in personal virtues. Torah study and observance of the mitzvot, the religious spiritual harmony and perfection that the group would create in this manner would establish a means by which the members could exert a thurgic influence, arouse the Holy One's attribute of chesed or loving kindness, bring about uh, dramatic changes in the messianic process, and fulfill the hopes of redemption. Well, shalom, Vishal. Thus, a few Kabbalists, including several great and famous ones, took this thinking one step further. They made Aliyah move to Israel for good as individuals in, in groups. Uh, there they believe they could invoke the superior uh, sanctity of the Holy Land to attain loftier spiritual heights and mystical achievements than those that could be accomplished on foreign soil. The sanctity of uh, the land of Israel and the psychological fortitude that the Olam would need were, there, were thought to be able potentially to elevate those who dwelled there to spiritual psychic experiences and prepare them for the revelation of the Torah's most hidden secrets. The land of Israel, however, would not would enhance not only the performance of the, the mitzvot and the prayers in accordance with Isaac Luria's uh, intent, it would also strengthen the mystical cleavage to Hashem and the ability to attain unifications and a sense of the soul relative to anything that could be accomplished elsewhere. Although Luriana Kabbalah concedes the possibility of completing the sorting process in the diaspora, only in the land of Israel may one fathom the full truth of Isaac Luria's writing, grasp the secrets of Kabbalah in their full depth, and obtain divine inspiration and ascent of the soul. For example, prostrating oneself on the tombs of the Kabbalistic masters in the Galilean hills at Moron and Sfat, uh, others thought that they could hasten the redemption by the very act of moving to the land of Israel settling the country and building up Jerusalem or Tiberias, an act that would have the practical significance of raising the Shekinah, the divine presence, from its dust and setting the Jewish redemption in motion. One of the most influential figures of this movement 
was the Italian uh, Kabbalist Emmanuel uh, Chayrici uh, from 1688 to 1743, who was active in the first half of the 18th century in Italy and the land of Israel. Ricci devoted his entire life to the study and interpretation, redaction, and dissemination of Lurianic Kabbalah, considering this the main road to hastening the, of the redemption. In his book, uh, Mishnat Hasidism, Amsterdam, 1727, he systemat- systematized and edited the teaching of Isaac Luria as Luria's disciples had reported them in an orderly and logical way. From then on, uh, Mishnat ha- Hasidim uh, was a mainstay in the study of Lurianic Kabbalah. By writing it, Ricci further the dissemination of Lurianic Kabbalah and greatly widened the circle of Jews who wished to study Luria's mystical intent in prayer and observation observance of the mitzvot, not to mention his unique practices. Apart from his influence in spreading Lurianic Kabbalah throughout the Jewish world, Emmanuel Hayrici made a decisive contribution to the resurgence of messianic ferment that lasted throughout the 18th century. It is important to, uh, to emphasize repeatedly that this happened in the immediate post sabbatean era, when the lessons of the Sabbatean messianic movements were still relatively fresh. Ricci performed ver- various end-rocking reckonings and geared them to a 41-year period that approximated his own time from 1740 to 1781. Notably, he was not alone in his, this pursuit. Other important Kabbalists, such as uh, Chaim uh, Biatar, uh, also determined that the Messianic era would end would dawn in 1740, halfway through the 6th century from the creation. Others advanced the date by several years. Uh, Moses, M- Moses Chaim Luzato, the Ramkal, for example, expected the redemption to occur in 1731. Shalom uh, Buz- Buzaglo ruled that in the messianic that the messianic era would commence in 1740 and that the messiah himself would arrive in 1789 the widespread reckoning of these of the end of days and the exact timing of the advent of messiah in this era were meant it seems to legitimize a form of activity that jewish tradition treats as aberrant and unacceptable in ordinary times Knowing the end time in Kabbalists' opinion was tantamount to the revelation of quasi-prophecy or one of the secrets of the Torah. Furthermore, in their view, the very act of the revelation is evidence of the imminence of the end. Therefore, now that they knew with certainty when the end would occur, the principled injunction against forcing the end lost its validity. In this manner, the belief in the imminence of the redemption exacerbated the already palpable messianic tensions. Indeed, messianic activity increased during this time, including, apart from the Aliyah movements that lie at the focal point of this book, exceptional spiritual and mystical actions meant to hasten the redemption, such as the use of practical Kabbalah and the quest for the ten tribes, which, according to their the tradition, would be discovered and returned to their land at the end of days. The range of messianic activities that were, that we describe in analyzing this book was characteristic of a period more than half a century long. It engaged many Jews from all corners of the diaspora, Kabbalists and conventional rabbinical scholars, householders, and common folk. Although historical research has discussed some of these activities and identify, even identified their messianic features, it has described them as isolated, non-recurrent events and phenomenon each independent of and unrelated to the others. We chose a different track. We searched for connections among the diverse phenomena of the time. All of them we found traced to the influence of Luriana Kabbalah and the effect of historical events that were invested with apocalyptic, messianic interpretations and significance. And how often have we in the last 40 years heard people view things in that similar light with apocalyptic, messianic, interpretive uh, significance. It's just, yeah, you got to keep sound out there, folks. Historical research on the 18th century not only failed to notice the relations among these phenomena, but also and mainly failed to identify the ties that linked the various rabbinical scholars and Kabbalists who studied Lurianic Kabbalah and disseminated it around the Jewish world, 
reckon the end of days and even made aliyah during this time. They include, for example, the group of Kabbalists that published a Hemdat Yamim in Izmir in 1731. It was mistakenly considered a sab- Sabbatean work, such as uh, Israel Jacob Al-Ghazi and Chaim Ab- Abdullafia of Izmir, a society of Moroccan Kabbalists led by Chaim B. Attar, the Kabbalists of Italy, including uh, Emmanuel Hayrici and Moses Chaim Luzato, the Kabbalists of the famous Cloys of Brody, including Eliezer uh, Rokich and Gershon of Kutau, the Belshem Tov's brother-in-law, uh, Gedala Ahayun of Constantinople, and Shalom uh, Sharabi of Yemen, who together headed the Kabbalistic Yeshiva in Bet El in Jerusalem. And the Hasidic leaders, disciples of Dov Ber, uh, the Maggid of uh, Mezrich, who moved to uh, Eretz Israel in 1777. Historical research has also overlooked the connection between the aforementioned Aliyah movements and several other famous attempts at Aliyah that were aborted, such as of the Baal Shem Tov before 1740 and that of the Vilna Gon in 1778. All of these actions, as I show in this book, fall into the framework of the Messianic era from 1740 to 1781 that Emmanuel Hayrici determined. So you can just see how the atmosphere influenced uh, the great scholars. Uh, even like I love how he mentioned the Baal Shem Tov, uh, the bearer of a good name, uh, and the Vilna Gaon, uh, who's considered the genius in, in Vilnius. Um, the atmosphere and uh, expectation of the, the the day influenced scholars, you know, to pool together and uh, uh, function with similar ideas. And um, yeah, we've seen a lot even in our day where people will finger point events and try to cite it as some connection is just almost like an anticipation, um, you know. And of course, we. We all would love to see the Mashiach uh, uh, come today, but uh, um, Hashem is the only one who determines the time. So, This book, inspired by the newly discovered archival findings, sheds new light on the entire chapters in the 18th century Jewish history. It describes and explains not only the flow uh, of Aliyah, but also, among other things, the establishment of mystical groups for the purpose of hastening the redemption and converting Jerusalem into a holy society the rebuilding of Tiberias, the searches for the Ten Tribes, the dispute between the Gaon of Vilna and the Schneer Zalman of Liadi over how to hasten the redemption, the messianic mo- motive behind the Hasidic Aliyah in 1777, and the complex histor- historically unique persona of the Vilna Gaon, who perceived himself as having a messianic mission to perform revealing the Torah as it had been handed down to Moses at Sinai and writing the final Halakha code that would lead directly to the imminent redemption of the Jewish people. Wow. All right, so we made it to chapter 1. The Messianic Window of Opportunity from 1740 to 1781, a bio- biographical sketch of Emmanuel Hayrici, one of the personalities who made meaningful contributions to uh, to the spurt of messianic hope in the 18th century was the Kabbalist Raphael Emanuel Hayrici, who died in 1743. Hi, Patricia. Glad to have you with us. Okay. He spent most of his t- life in, in uh, Italy, it sounds like. While still a young man, Ricci developed a penchant for the occult, Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism, evidently under the influence of local atmosphere Indeed, in Italy, more than anywhere else in the diaspora, there was a concentration of Kabbalistic activity that dealt mainly in Messianism and reckonings of the end of days. Ricci was captivated by the allure of Kabbalah and pledged all his efforts to it, especially after he elevated his Kabbalistic endeavors to a higher rung and ascended the traditional term for emigrating to the land of Israel, Tzfat, uh, the capital of Kabbalists, where he established his home. Here, in the uh, intense atmosphere of Kabbalistic activities, spiritual and ritual, he absorbed the Luriana Kabbalah, the mystical teachings of Isaac Luria, Ashkenazi, the Ari, and his disciples. 
Ricci settled in Eretz Israel uh, in Palestine in 1718 after having written two volumes of rabbinical commentary. It was no easy decision to leave a safe place of residence and a source of livelihood, a position as a teacher of children, and to settle with a young family in the land of Israel, especially since he had just recently reached a period of tranquility in his life after experiencing significant hardships. The difficulty of his decision to relocate to Israel uh, is evident in his cautious phrasing and carefully chosen words. I had hardly completed two years of residence in the town of Gorizia, Italy, when my heart instructed me to set out with my wife and children to the land of Canaan, the holy uh, land of Israel. So I went there and, and ascended to Safed. Uh, may it speedily be rebuilt, where I spent about two years. Although his uh, Safed period lasted only two years or so, it was qualitatively crucial in forming his personality and influencing his worldview. He spent this time totally immersed in Kabbalah, foremost in its Lurianic version. In Saf Sfat, Emmanuel Hairici had spiritual experiences of the most exalted type. The tombs of the ancient Jewish saints, most of which are in the Galilee, and especially those of the, the crafters of Kabbalistic doctrine, uh, uh, Simon Bar Yochai and Isaac Luria, gave the area a charged and uplifted atmosphere that was unmatched elsewhere. Here, in such a climate, it was but a natural to perform one of the rituals of Kabbalistic mysticism, the custom of prostrating oneself on the tomb of saints. Emmanuel Hairici adhered to these customs and visited the tombs of the Ari with particular frequency, driven by a profound yearning to attain, by communing with the soul of the saint, knowledge and understanding of the Kabbalistic doctrine, that carries the sage's name. Ricci describes these matters with his typical brevity and careful choice of words. There in Sfat, may it be forever rebuilt, I was privileged to study personally the book of the Ari. I copied and read the entire book, uh, Azrot Hayim, uh, and along with it, the other writings of the late saintly Ari that were available until I found what my soul thirsted for. I was helped by the privilege of having prostrated myself on the tomb of the late sainted Ari and having begged him for his merit to give me the protection needed to understand his teachings. Living conditions in the land of Israel were harsh. Epidemics were common occurrences. One of them claimed the life of Ricci's daughter. Regarding this as the hand of God, Emmanuel Hairici left Israel, the land of Israel, along with his family, his wife and his two surviving children, evidently fate-stricken, he was captured by pirates in the midst of his voyage to the country of his birth, Italy, but managed to survive by reaching Livorno, Italy. There he had sufficient time to write uh, Mishnat Hasidim, a summary of the Lurianic Kabbalah that he had studied and investigated thoroughly while in, in Sfat. He summarized his remarks on this topic in his book, For there three years that I tarried there in Livorno, God gave me the privilege to write this attractive and easily comprehensible book, Mishnat Hasidim, in which I summarize all available writings of the late St. Liari in crisp language, much like that of the late Mamonides in his Mishnah Torah, so that a few words capture the meaning of a great many. In his introduction to Mishnat Hasidim, uh, Ricci describes the sequence of events that prompted him to write the book. When he reached Livorno, uh, he joined a group of scholars who were engaged in the study of the occult. He did not wish to stand out among them as someone who had personal knowledge that could enhance their understanding of Luriana Kabbalah. Instead, he wished to acquire further knowledge of the Kabbalistic discipline generally and to bask in the imagery of the Ecclesiastes 7.12 for to be in the shelter of the wisdom is to be also in the shelter of money. By reading Ritchie's account, one gets the sense of his humility. Each and every day, I, uh, I write it in the dust of the feet of those erudite sages who pledge themselves to a massing of knowledge as they attempt to hand down rabbinical rulings on the basis of overt and covert teachings. He observes them as they sit on the bench of judgment to determine the Jews' fate. Indeed, theirs is an iron bedstead quoting Deuteronomy 3.11, one that embraces both the overt and the covert. 
At some point, however, the group of scholars encountered an irresolvable difficulty in understanding Luria's intentions. At this injuncture, Emmanuel Hayrici reports having heard one of the leading members of the group express the wish to find someone who could explain the Lurianic teachings in order, an orderly and systematic fashion. Ricci considered this request a divine indication that Hashem wished him to undertake the difficult task of pouring Lurianic Kabbalah into new vessels in order to make it comprehensible to scholars. Since an edict written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet may not be revoked, he was absolutely convinced that the ostensibly random remark was directed at him. Since no one else had delved so deeply understanding them and mastering Luriana Kabbalah, and no one else could accept the responsibility, there was a problem. However, since he had returned destitute from the land of Israel, he had no books. As matters worked out, the scholars who had expressed the dis, dis, disdoratum agreed to lend Ricci his, his own books so he might do the work. Armed with the writings of Luria and his disciples, Ricci threw himself into the task. I allowed myself neither pace nor quiet, and I did not rest until I reached my desired destination. Jewish society took a severely critical attitude toward dabbling in Kabbalistic teachings. Insofar as Jews engaged in this form of study, they did so furative, or furtively, individually, or in small elitist groups. Emmanuel Hayrici, aware that his book could potentially transform the public's attitude toward Kabbalistic study, set out to defend the doctrine of Kabbalah and the act of pursuing it. In Ricci's view, his very success in tackling Luriana Kabbalah and summarizing it in a teachable form was itself proof that the time to legitimize Kabbalistic study had come. Ricci did not seek personal uh, praise of any sort. He credited his success to divine providence, which had made him an agent on this endeavor. It was, as in the Talmudic dictum, one who wishes to purify himself is helped. Had God not bestowed upon me his beneficence and plentitude to assist me in this labor, I could not have done it. Moreover, if his success were truly the result of divine providence, Hashem indeed seemed to have signaled that the time had come to disseminate Kabbalah generally and Lurianic Kabbalah practically, particularly. Therefore, Ricci undertook to enhance the re repute of the Kabbalistic doctrine itself. He based his teachings in this matter on the fact that the value and importance of knowing Kabbalah and the utility of studying it have already been acknowledged as manifest in the holy books of the great sages who preceded him. On which I based myself, however, Kabbalah is so su supremely sacred that the preoccupation with its study should be circumscribed i.e. not everyone who wishes to study it should be allowed to do so. It's for the initiated. Therefore, one should be precise in stipulating the terms of study. Here I'll give you a great rule that I saw in Sfat. Maybe it'd be speedily rebuilt in a manuscript that came from Jerusalem. Anyone who wishes to penetrate the exaltedness of this teaching in depth should first take proper measure of himself and ascertain that he knows his lowly value, one who does not realize that his crude intellect is a buffer between himself and the spiritual should distance himself from Kabbalah. That's a big point there. One who does not realize that his crude intellect is a buffer between himself and the spiritual should distance himself from Kabbalah. As an arrow distances itself from the bow, he should blame himself for any deficiency in understanding Kabbalah, saying that it is solely due to him and should accept this in truth and faith and not deny it. Thus, anyone incapable of attaining the high intellectual level of abstract comprehension that one needs to fathom Kabbalah must not engage very important must not engage in it, lest his shortcomings blind him to the absolute truth of Kabbalah and lead him to repudiate it. In fact, there is a fine line between prohibiting and allowing the study of Kabbalah, since those truly capable of attaining the requisite level are not only allowed to study Lurianic Kabbalah, but should consider this as a duty and a, and a great religious deed. Quoting Chaim Vital, Luria's foremost disciple, Ricci uh, explained that the contrast to the past when teaching of the secrets of Kabbalah was forbidden 
at the present time, Hashem considers the study of Kabbalah a great religious imperative. Rabbi Chaim Vital wrote that every penalty revealed by this wisdom that he wrote pertains to those generations only in our generation. However, it is a religious imperative and a great delight to Hashem to reveal this wisdom, and by virtue of its revelation, the Messiah will come. I don't know what to say on that. Furthermore, further on, Ricci uh, repeatedly stresses the unique value of Kabbalah and its being composed of two fundamental values, truth and faith, that by their very nature cannot be fathomed by the human intellect and its reasoning capacities. This is because this science is exactly as named truth and faith. One should not concoct reasonings in Kabbalah from one's own mind, lest one learn from them to use Kabbalah for falsehood. (laughs) As he continues, Ricci based himself in this matter on the writings of Chaim Vital, whom he admires. First, one should treat the uniqueness of Kabbalah prudently and study it judiciously and cautiously only. See Chaim Vital's remarks in the introduction to his book, uh, as Chaim, wise men, heed me. Do not break through to the Lord to gaze into the books of latter authorities that are written in accordance with the human intellect. Those who heed me will live securely and serenely. Therefore, I, the young man, saw fit to privilege the masses and enlighten them with a small part of the introductory teachings that I received uh, and inherited from my mentor, the great departed rabbi, the Ari. Even this I present in a limited outline form as if peering through cracks with succinct brevity that masks large omissions. Those of intellect will understand. Emmanuel Hayrici's subsequent comments are also based on the writings of Chaim Vitel, since Kabbalah is not predicated on the human intellect. It is very dangerous to study because people tend to treat as false anything that does not correspond to and emanate from the intellect. Very big point. In other words, a student who has intellectual shortcomings in grasping Kabbalah may treat its teachings as false. To avert such a situation, Chaim Vitel cautions the potential student, if you manage that you can select what is good and leave aside what is bad, do not rely on your understanding. After all, these matters are not given over to the human mind as the human intellect would have it, and it is highly dangerous to apply one's reasoning to them. Only one whose hand does not slip out of the Ari's hand, to use the expression of Chaim Vital, Luria's disciple and re- recorder of his writings, is allowed and entitled to convey Luriana Kabbalah as precisely and authoritatively as possible. Emmanuel Hayrici spent three years in Livorno after finishing writing uh, Mishnat uh, Hasdim. There he moved from one place to another until he eventually wished to return to the land of Israel. Evidently, however, his eagerness to disseminate the teachings of Kabbalah overcame his yearnings for the land of Israel, so he stayed over in Syria for about two more years to oversee the printing of his fifth book, Yosher Levav, which he described as the soul of the Mishnat Hasidim. For whoever teaches man's, man wisdom portrays in some manner in his intellect the matter of zimsum or withdrawal, creation, knowledge of the creator and the selection of man, as well as the intentions that should inform the performance of the commandments and prayers and the way to resolve contradictions in the dicta of the sages and the writings of the late exalted Saint Ari and other similar matters pertaining to the Messianic era, all of which is presented with clear evidence from our Holy Torah, which was given as a legacy to his people, Israel. On September 23rd, 1737, Emmanuel Hayrici returned to the land of Israel and this time settled in Jerusalem. This is the 10th city in which I have lived permanently, he wrote, and without taking an oath in the matter, here I will dwell because I desire it, from Psalm 132.4. At this time, Hayrici wrote two additional books, Adarat Eliyahu and Hazazion, and as he expressed, it was privileged to rebuild one of the ruins of Jerusalem. Apparently, he had to leave his homeland again to raise funds to cover debts that he had incurred in purchasing the abandoned hovel uh, and to establish a yeshiva as he planned. On February 25, 1743, as he was traveling past 
uh, Modena, Italy, on his way back to the land of Israel, Manya Hayrichi was robbed and murdered by bandits. The mystical persona of Emmanuel Hayrichi. One may get an idea of the self-image of Emmanuel Hayrichi and his mystical persona from entries in his personal writings, which were found posthumously. Uh, Ricci's son, Abraham Samuel Ricci, who published his father's last book, Zazion, added two remarks on the last page that cement his image as a mystic. The Jews of the Medina who found Ricci's body sometime after the murder discovered to their astonishment that his facial features had not been disturbed, uh, a phenomenon that attests to the man's holiness. The second remark relates more to Ricci's self-image. Among his personal effects, it was related was his personal prayer book in which a note in his handwriting was found describing two dreams that he had dreamt in Jerusalem in 1740, the Jewish year 5500. In the first dream, he was told that the, he was fated to die a martyr's death. According to the second, he was told that his soul is a reincarnation of that of the, the, the Tana Judah uh, Bava, one of the, the ten martyrs of Rome. I've written down the dream letter from my uh, dream letter for letter, word for word, as found in my father's handwriting in his prayer book. A recollection that in Jerusalem, the holy city, in the year 5500, I dreamt in the month of Av or Elul. I do not remember exactly which one night that I had I and another person would be killed as martyrs to Hashem. Later that very year, on the eve of the Sabbath, uh, Niz- Nizavim uh, Veleka Velech. They told me in a dream that the soul of my son Moshe Chaim is the soul of Atena. I asked him who I was. I was uh, of a mind to ask whether I was Shimon or or Yochai. I was too embarrassed to allow the question to cross my lips. Before I could ask, they told me, you are uh, Judah Bibava. The entire story is shrouded in the spiritual influence of Chaim Vital on Emmanuel Hayrichi. Vital. Uh, Isaac Luria's foremost disciple and a man of acute messianic awareness made it his custom to document dreams that he had had about himself and that others had about him in regard to his purpose in life, including his messianic purpose. The fact that Emmanuel Hayrichi followed in his spiritual mentor's footsteps by writing down the contents of two dreams, which largely amount to one, tells us something about his self-image being the psychic reincarnation of one of the ten martyrs of Rome, coupled with the news of his own martyr's death, suggested to him that he, like them, was destined to play a role of some kind in the redemption of the Jewish people. Although he did not attain the highest level of all, that of the creator of the mystic doctrine, uh, Shimon Bar Yochai, he was privileged with an exalted station, indeed, that one of the ten martyrs of Rome that of one of the ten martyrs of Rome. In regard to reincarnation, too, Ricci was influenced by Chaim Vitel. According to Kabbalistic doctrine of reincarnation, individuals of acute historical awareness see themselves as persons whose souls are intended to correct, in the Kabbalistic sense, something that has gone wrong in the Jewish historical process, even if the flaw was in, in, engendered by Zadokim, the pillars of the Jewish world. Therefore, reincarnation is central in the thinking of messianic-minded Kabbalists. Indeed, Chaim Vitel believed that he had been brought into the world to repair such flaws. Often, he expressed the conviction that he was reincarnation of Rabbi Akiva, Mamanides, or some other personality of the biblical or Talmudic era. Of course, people never seem to think they're reincarnated from a from a moth, right? It's always a big scholar. When Vitel stepped forward to repair the sins of these cardinal personalities, the repair was was aimed at a specific flaw inadvertently introduced in these persons' own purpose in life. For example, he construes his very own involvement in Kabbalah as the repair of a defect that Mamanides caused over having preferred dealing in philosophy over Kabbalah. Emmanuel Hayrichi saw himself as, as having a messianic life purpose, Initially, when he believed himself to be a psychic reincarnation of Simon or his father Yochai, he considered it his destiny to repair some defect in the study of Kabbalah. After the fact, however, he realized, thanks to a dream, that his purpose in life was to act to bring, 
was to act to bring forward the redemption. Since he himself was a reincarnation of one of the ten martyrs of Rome, his own life purpose in Kabbalistic terms was to lift the sparks of kingship from the shells, i.e. to bring the kingship of the Messiah, the son of David, Ricci alluded to such in an in interpretation of his messianic purpose in life in his commentary on Psalms found in his book, uh, Hazazion. A deeply mystical Kabbalistic experience that Emmanuel Hayrichi was privileged to undergo <clears throat> as he relates several times was revelation from Elijah. As a rule, Kabbalistic teaching has a specific lineage, a process of revelation of secrets and inner truths of the Torah by transmission and reception from individual to individual in a generational chain back to Moses and the patriarchs. <coughs> Worthy individuals, however, are privileged to receive the revelations, revelation of secrets of the Torah directly from the prophet Elijah himself or from other early spiritual giants. Simone bar Yukai, the founder of Kabbalistic teaching, was such a person. Isaac Luria was another. He had merited the acquisition of secret knowledge and the meanings of oblique allusions in Torah by revelation from Elijah. Thus, Lurianic Kabbalah was given to him as the revelation of secrets from something other than a flesh-and-blood persona. The teaching of a person as privileged as this are obvious, tr obviously true and sublimely, sublimely accurate. Emmanuel Hayrichi, aware of his mystical power, tells us that after having received the revelation from Elijah, he began to exert himself in order to be worthy of further appearances by Elijah and additional revelations of the Torah, Torah's hidden secrets. In his book, Yosher Levav, he explains, do not be puzzled by my many references to the prophet Elijah in this book. I do this so that I may be privileged when I call out to him to have him enlighten my soul so that it may understand secrets of Torah. After God gave me the privilege of seeing Elijah in a dream, that the year that I wrote Ma'asa uh, Choshev, I asked him to interpret one phrase in the Zohar for me. In response, he asked me whether I wished to see the afterworld, and I answered in the affirmative. As I continued to walk with him in order to see him, I awakened that same year I had the privilege of seeing his son uh, Jonah B. Amittai, the boy born to the woman from uh, Zerfat, whom he received, revived, in uh, this is the Messiah, son of Joseph. I remember having seen him in a cave wrapped in a prayer shawl in Teflon. The end of days as reckoned by Emmanuel Hayrichi from 1740 to 1781. Okay, Emmanuel Hayrichi does not credit his efforts to decode the Luriana Kabbalah to his own intellectual power, as noted above, he attributes his success to divine assistance and attributes his understanding of many segments of Luriana Kabbalah to revelation from Elijah. In the last chapter of his book, uh, Yosher uh, Levav, Ricci addresses himself at length to the question of the advent of the Messiah. He bases his messianic outlook on the timing of the end of days on the Zohar and grounds his view of the practical nature and workings of the process in the concept of Burium in Luriana Kabbalah. He augments these associatively with evidence based on various Talmudic dicta and combines them all into reckonings of the end of days. And this is what I find difficult. And this is why I want to read this book is because there's so many depth of notions when it comes to messianic stuff that you have too many people try to pull together in shoestring uh, uh, threads of ideas and thoughts and that actually may or may not be uh, connected or interconnected. You know, and we've saw this in, in our days as, a, you know, from the coming as someone who come out of Christianity, I mean, uh, one of the most profound books that affected them uh, in the last 50 years or so um, was the uh, uh, um, late great planet Earth. Uh, by Hal Lindsey. I mean, the thing sold like 14, 15 million copies or something. And uh, you get down in the Bible belt down in, in the United States. I mean, they all hold that dispensational premillennialist view of theology. Uh, and it's, it, it, you know, they just, the way the ideas shoestring the notions together. 
but even reading how uh, this is written, you see how false groups like uh, the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, you know, started by, you know, writing uh, a timeline. And uh, it's just not a proper practice. I've, I've heard uh, Rabbi uh, Tovia Singer say clearly, nobody knows. You just, nobody knows and you can't. But there's always some noodle that seems to think I got the brain to handle this and I can connect the, the spaghetti uh, together. And um, yeah, nonetheless. First, he determines the, uh, the, the status of someone Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, in knowing the secret of the end of days. It is our accepted belief, he says, that the Holy One did not disclose even uh, to his limbs, the prophets and the ministering angels, the time of the final end of days. After all, Hashem prefers the Chachem or a sage uh, to a Navi or a prophet, and equally a Zadik uh, to the ministering angels. However, since Simon Bar Yochai was worthy of both titles, the end of days, a secret that Hashem did not reveal even to his heart, his prophets and the angels was disclosed to him. I don't know about that. I think the rabbis today would hold nobody knows clearly. Emmanuel Hayrichi, though, realized that the timing of the redemption was an exceedingly sensitive topic. After all, there had recently been a crisis of faith revolving around this issue. Therefore, he felt it his duty to relate to the questions of how the end, uh, the time of the end of days mentioned in the Zohar had passed and the Messiah had not come. Did these uh, facts not challenge the veracity of the Zohar? Here, Ricci has little to, new to say. He explains the issue in the manner favored routinely by many before and after him. In these cases, he explains the time at issue is not the Kezhas Satum, the, the, the unrevealed end, the end of time that God did not disclose even to his ministering angels and prophets. The dates mentioned explicitly in the Zohar represent occasions of Hashem's desire to redeem the Jews even before the final end that has been established for them. In other words, if the Jews' spiritual condition at that time is such that they are worthy of redemption, then Hashem's desire will well up and will shorten the duration of the exile hasten the end of days, and redeem his people. As Ricci states, in those end of days, we had a window of hope that he would expedite the redemption by a dint of our merits more than in the other years. If we fail to repent, the end will not come until its unrevealed time, which is termed ba'eta uh, in its time. Then it will undoubtedly come. Now, these are key points that he's explaining the terms that the rabbis use what can be known and what cannot be known. Um, so he's saying he's not talking about that true issue that cannot be known, but a period. And I think one of the key key things, uh, key points, uh, similar to what he's trying to describe, would be um, 1948 when uh, um, the Balfour Declaration allowed the Israelites to, 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 to move back to the land of Israel and, and, and acknowledged it as a, a nation, the reality is that they had just gone through such persecution during World War II and the Holocaust that um, it was a type of revealed uh, redemption for them. The distinction between these two types of end of days is one of the mechanisms used to mitigate the possibility of a crisis of faith in the event that the end of days does not occur according to a given reckoning. The distinction is based on the prophetic utterance, I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time from Isaiah 60, 22. The sages sense the contradiction between in its time, meaning that redemption will occur at a specific, the specific time intended for it, uh, albeit uh, initio, and I will hasten it, meaning that God will expedite the redemption and effectuate it before its predetermined time. On this basis, they explain pithily that the, the prophet is speaking of two possibilities, of the advent of the redemption, if the Jews deserve redemption, I will hasten it, and if not, it will come in its time. And so this is generally to help you understand how the Jews view um, the coming of Messiah. They can, yeah, if, if, um, if they're prepared, uh, Hashem will hasten it, and if they're not, it's going to happen when Hashem, who knows all about all, including each and every variable of all existence over all time, all at once and forever, he knows it's time. Uh, and 
and nothing's going to alter what Hashem knows, for he is Hashem. Thus, end of days, reckonings, regularly offer several potential dates that God may invoke if he wishes to hasten the redemption. The end may come on any of these dates if the conditions for redemption are fulfilled. The timing of the end of days in its time, in contrast, is undisclosed and unknowable. That's the general rabbinical position. This occasion belongs to the realm of God's law established since time immemorial and is part of the historical march of world history in which the Jewish people plays a role in the family of nations. Having established his messianic conception as flowing from a supremely authoritative source and eliminated the obstacle of dates that had not come to pass, Emmanuel Hayrichi now turns to the task of calculating the advent of the end of days. Predictably, the entire chapter is enveloped in an acute messianism related to the end of days, reckoned that are, are proximate and to the, the author's own time. The redemption, as perceived by Ricci, is not a, catastrophic, not a catastrophic event that will occur in one stroke, but rather a historical process that will last 41 years. The process will be marked by clear evidence at its outset as is, it progresses and at its end. The period will be unstable with manifestations of dissemination of Kabbalistic teachings on the one hand and an upturn in anti-Jewish persecution on the other hand. In Ritchie's opinion, there is no contradiction in these matters since one of the characteristics of the impending end of days is the process of ending the barium, i.e. a process of refinement and pur purgation in which good is separated from evil, evil is separated from good, and the negative forces are cast out. The Gentile nation's Reaction against the Jewish people is part of the Messianic Berur process. The more pressure the Gentiles bring against the Jewish people, the more the latter will have to determine for itself the root causes of the nation's hostility towards them. The Jewish people will have to discover its identity and a singularity among the nations, and in the aftermath of this inquiry will also clarify its standing and purpose. And this is what I think we're trying to do as part of the Noahide World Center uh, out of Jerusalem, and uh, this is kind of the tone that I get from uh, Rabbi Goldberg and several others that, uh, yeah, their identity is coming together uh, and their distinction among the nations. Um, and in the aftermath of all this inquiry, it will also clarify its standing and its purpose. And uh, this is what I see come out of a lot of the classes uh, uh, for sure. In the aftermath, of these actions, the Jewish process, the process of Jewish national repentance will be expedited. Yes, in Ricci's opinion, the nearest date that may inaugurate the Messianic era is the year 5500, which was 1740. By his reckoning, this year is the midday of the sixth millennium since the creation. For this reason, it may constitute the water's uh, head point in time for the divine and the human system. This year, he says, is not a deadline, but rather the beginning of a gradual process related to the revelation and concealment of the Redeemer. In Kabbalistic terms, a day for God corresponds to a millennium for human beings. This view is based on the verse, a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday when it is past. And then he gives his source. Accordingly, a temporal hour of God is one twelfth of one thousand years of human life. Uh, a human temporal hour being one twelfth of the interval from dusk to dawn, 83 and one third years. Ricci's method of reckoning the end of days is pr predicated on the Talmudic dictum the world will exist for, for 6,000 years. 2,000 uh, chaos, 2,000 Torah, 2,000 days of the Messiah. In practical terms, the decree of Jewish exile will be in effect only for 1,000 years. This millennia by divine determination is the fifth millennium from the creation. In Kabbalistic terms, it belongs to the Sephira, divine attribute of Chod, or glory. Uh, the verse fragment, uh, Kol Hayom Dava, the whole day is agony from Lamentations 114, refers to this millennium. Chod and Dava, agony, are spelled with the same three letters. 
the change in their order alludes clearly to the turnaround in meaning. The other two millennia represented by the, the letters Dalet and, and Vav in the Sephira of Chod pertain to the fourth and sixth millennia as letters carry the numerical values of four and six, respectively. However, these millennia are not contig contiguous. Since the destruction of the temple occurred in the middle of the fourth millennia, the corrective act should take place in the manner at the end, at the time that are parallel and opposite i.e. the third temple will be built in the middle of the sixth millennium, consequently the fifth millennium, which belongs interesting point, i got to keep uh, notes, consequently the fifth millennium, which belongs entirely to the realm of Dava, agony, is augmented by additional intervals of time before and after, part of the late fourth millennium, part of the first half of the sixth millennium. Ricci argues that the delay in the Messiah's advent during the sixth millennium corresponds in terms of the divine timetable to the time of the, the, the destruction of the second temple. According to the Zohar, this happened when the shadows of evening tilted. The question that Ritchie ha attempts to probe is to which temporal hour the expression refers. In other words, exactly when in God's day do the shadows of evening tilt? And in human terms, when in the fourth millennia was the temple destroyed and when in the sixth, following the parallel, will the redemption take place? All the support that he invokes in his response is meant to corroborate the idea that the end of days will occur six and a half hours into the sixth millennium, i.e. in the year 5540 and eight months. To buttress his argument, he quotes from the Talmudic tractum, tractate Peshram, uh, the Talmud regular regular sacrifice is slaughtered at the eighth and one half hours when the eve of Pesach falls on Shabbat. It is sacrificed at six and one half hours. In this, re in regard to this, the Gemara states: Rava said the Tamid or the sacrifice is commanded when the shadow of evening tilts. The tractate Yoma also discusses the matter relating to the time of the tilting of the evening shadow in concepts of light and shadow. Here the Talmud explains that the Temid sacrifice was slaughtered at six and one half hours because the walls of the temple were misaligned. Therefore, the shadow tilted from west to east, not exactly at midday, but half an hour later. Continuing the argument, Emmanuel Hairici reinforces his finding that a redemption will not occur exactly at midday in the middle of the millennium in the year 5500, 1740. After all, the temple was not destroyed at exactly midday, but rather when the shadow of evening tilted after midday. He concludes by stating the parallelism as happened in its destruction, so will it happen in its construction. Thus, the redemption itself will take place sometime after the six hours uh, of the year 5500. Emmanuel Hayrichi sees no contradiction between his calculations and another end of days, reckoning that of the Zohar Hadash on the portion of Ayeshev, which makes the year 5540 and not 5541 as the year of the redemption. Ricci bases his remarks on the Zohar's commentary on the verse fragments, uh, Semhenu, Himot, uh, Initanu, uh, delight us as in the days of your afflictions, from Psalm 90, verse 15 and claims that the year 5540 will be the time when the redemption begins. Thus, indications of the redemption will begin to appear in 5540. Here again, we encounter the parallel between redemption and exile, between what will occur and what already transpired at the time the temple was destroyed. For as Emmanuel Hayrichi explains, citing the Talmud, the temple gave an indication of its imminent destruction 40 years before it was destroyed. The doors of the sanctuary opened by themselves, Thus, 5540 is an important conjuncture in the redemption process that will peak in the eighth month of 5541. Emmanuel Hayrichi reinforces this concept by invoking Kabbalistic concepts in the Zohar's commentary on the portion Vayera every 60 years since the beginning of the sixth millennium. The kingship ascends one level among the ten Sephiroth. In other words, according to this reckoning in the year 5540, after having ascended nine steps, the kingship 
will begin to climb the tenth step, the Sephira of Keter royalty, the distance between the beginning of the step of the tenth Sephira, uh, the year 5540 and the year 5541 in eight months. Uh, a continuation of the progression of this Sephira is meant to allow the Sephira of Keter to enrich itself. Thus, Ricci applies the, the Notricon technique or wordplay on Keter to explain the 20 month delay of redemption from 5540 to 5541 in eight months. You can see how such wise men, you know, got it wrong for sure. But, you know, how, you know, trying to untangle spaghetti knots just doesn't work. As stated from 54540 to the end of days in 5541, a process of completing the Burim will take place. At the beginning of this period, the Jewish people will suffer numerous agonies and diminish grievously in, grievously in number. Ooh, no nice to hear. At its end, the Messiah will come. All uh, propitious destinies will come to pass, and sublime delight will reign. The ultimate purpose of the woes that God will bring upon his chosen people is not to harm them and certainly not to exterminate them. He vents his rage against the Jewish people in a measured fashion and in small increments, as the Talmud explains. One may liken it to a king who became angry with his son and, noticing a large stone in front of him, vowed to hurl it at his son. The king said, if I throw it at my son, he will not live. What did he do? He shattered it into pebbles and threw them at him one by one. Ah, as a result, his son was unscathed. And the king honored his vow. Whoa, what an analogy. One of the difficulties that Emmanuel Hairici faced in reckoning the end of days is, find in the, is the fighting in the Zohar that the end of days, the year of redemption would be 5600 or 1840. After all, if Ricci's reckoning of 1781 as the final year of the re, certain redemption in his time, why does the Zohar mention 1840? in several decades, several decades removed as the year of redemption, along with along with other occasions for the end of days, Ricci seemed unstable to disengage from his basic concept, in which the 5541 redemption moment will be the last one. Thus, he assigns the year 5600 a whole different role in his perception of divine realms and wisdom in the redemption era. What the Zohar writes on Vaira, as mentioned above, is that 600 years into the 6th millennium, the gates of wisdom will open. Obviously, the year 5600 will follow the advent of Messiah. It is not that the redemption will occur then. It will occur at the time stated. That is to say, the Messianic era will indeed begin in the 8th month of the year of 5541, back in 1781. As it progressed in 5600 in advance of Advanced phase of redemption will occur. The wellspring of divine wisdom will be revealed to humankind. Finally, Emmanuel Hayrichi addresses himself to the great mystery if 5541 is indeed the year of, in its time, redemption, i.e. the final time for the end of days. Why does the Zohar refrain from citing this year explicitly, as opposed to the other occasions for the end of days? Here, Ritchie seems to turn the challenge on its head and mobilize it in support of his argument. Shimon Bar Yochai he explains, wish to follow the way of the Torah, which does not reveal the time of the final end of days and did not want to state the years explicitly as he did the other end of days that the Zohar mentioned. Instead, he alluded to them. Even though Emmanuel Hayrichi never said explicitly that 5541 would actually be the year of the time, year of the, in its time, redemption, his reference to the characteristic of this year as an end time attest to his conviction that it was so. Especially conspicuous in his writings is the absence of one of the most pronounced attributes uh, of the hastened timing of the end of days, the demand for repentance as a prerequisite. By implication, the end of days that Ricci discusses, discusses is certain, final, and absolute to take place whether the Jews repent or not. In some calculations of the end of days, are the oxygen that fans the flames of messianic tension at all times. A fiorti after, a sab after the Sabbatean crisis at the, the grim time, 
Traditional Judaism needed not only reattach itself to the normative Torah and purge deviant circles, but also basing itself on messianic expectations to reckon the end of days. The calculations ranging from 5500 to 5541, that year 1740 to 1781, established a new emphasis on the pre-messianic era during this time, as I will show, Kabbalists would take sundry and diverse actions to fulfill the messianic potential of the time, from Chaim uh, Abdullafia's attempt to rebuild Tiberias through mystical activities of groups of Kabbalists and Hasidim, including the Baal Shem Tov and his disciples, to the Gaon of Vilna's attempt to establish an agreed and final new Shulchan Aruch. And I think I will stop there for today because these chapters are quite large. Uh, but we've made some good progress. We've got it through 8% of the book today, which is pretty good. Uh, I'm pretty thankful. It's definitely introducing some characters I've never heard of before, and some I have. Uh, but it's nice to just see or get a, a, a clear uh, view into the window of the past. I can obviously tell um, that... Um, and obviously uh, tell that uh, uh, Dr. Morgenstern is uh, uh, definitely uh, quite a historian. Uh, it's not an era that I've uh, focused on um, in my studies. I love studying ancient uh, um, history uh, and uh, archaeology and even, you know, paleontology, some of that stuff. I mean, for me, I find that quite interesting. Uh, but this is really opening up a, uh, uh, an era uh, in the 17th and 18th century uh, of what was going on in especially Judaism. But you can just see how uh, messianic expectation uh, fuels uh, 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 thoughts. And um, we've seen enough of it in our day and age, especially in the last 50 years here in the West. I mean, you know, just minds and the panic and the, the way some people think i mean we had the year 2000 where everybody thought the world was going to come to an end and then again in 2012 um nobody needs to be so uh, uh distraught with drama if you walk with hashem and know that he is in complete control and uh has a a, a good end in store for those that love him um there's no reason uh uh, to be mentally taxed. I find uh, nothing more psychiatric than um, a mind that tries to shoestring spaghetti together and say, see, 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 it's all connected, when in reality it's just a lump of tangled mess. Um, you know, anything on this planet, I find, is of the earth. And uh, you call it plainly what it is, and just because thoughts can be, you know, tangled, uh, doesn't make them connected. Okay. Uh, this is why I so prize, uh, how, uh, uh, the Rambam always pushes towards intellectual virtue, um, and understanding what being virtuous is. And if you have intellectual virtue, you're going to pursue soundness in all that you do. Uh, whereas I find a lot of mysticism, uh, it's trying to pursue things that are non-logical. And uh, I've seen it uh, in some people's minds that if you can explain it, it can't be real according to them. And that is so um, intellectually unvirtuous. It's, it's like, you, you know, they have to start talking fiction, fiction as fact, and that is, is delusional. And uh, we want you all out there to have a soundness of mind. But just want you to know there's nothing new under the sun that uh, uh, things do repeat themselves. And uh, we can see here in the 17th, 18th century, um, you know, the way uh, uh, expectations start to fuel actions. And uh, we hope and pray uh, uh, that as B'nai Noah grow, that uh, people will begin to function and make the world a better place setting things up for uh the correct uh time that hashem has established and i think you know he did do some explaining 
Well, bless you, Patricia. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, uh, yeah, this one auspicious for this time. Uh, we, yeah, we find ourselves. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, uncertainty going on out in the world with this COVID, uh, over the last couple of years. And now you've got tensions over in the Ukraine and, you know, people's minds, you know, everybody wants to have a degree of security. Everybody wants to have a degree of hope. Um, you know, I find joy, uh, where there is no hope. I find it's very difficult to have joy where there is no hope. And, uh, when people have hopes dashed and beaten down into the dust, it's very, very hard to be happy and joyful. And I really hope that, um, B'nai Noah can shine that light of, uh, uh, true happiness and true joy, um, based on the, the walk of divine providence, you know, walking with Hashem, uh, honorably and, and, and being kind in this world because, uh, Hashem is kind. Uh, but I think that we're going to get into some really deep topics here in this, in this, uh, wonderful, uh, this wonderful book on the Gaon of Vilna and his messianic vision. But I think what he's doing is he's leading us, the writer, uh, Dr. Morgenstern's leading us in the surroundings, he's painting the picture, like he's getting the backdrop down uh, before he's introducing us to the Gaon uh, in his messianic vision, uh, this, uh, uh, yeah, this uh, Emmanuel Hairici. I mean, you can tell if he came out of Italy, I mean, you know, Italy is Roman Catholic uh, traditionally, and, um, you know, certain thoughts get established with anybody living there it's the hotbed and uh you know to see somebody grow out of that but even the ram Kull, you know who i a material i love uh i what i found great about the ram Kull is he was able to uh, you know we did the path of the just and we also did uh other ones uh of ram Kull's. he was one who was able to chunk it down into bite size uh, deci decipherable uh, uh, tidbits so that we could ingest it and integrate it and uh, uh, boom, understand and let our, uh, our neshamas work and clean our uh, uh, soul uh, below. And uh, yeah, useful, useful stuff. But I hope, I think we're going to get into uh, a lot of messianic concepts and, and conversations in this book that um, need to be considered um, but w the world we're in today has such a, a vast, uh, concept that needs correction. And, uh, hopefully, uh, there's some words in this book that actually, um, you know, leak back out into the world, like, uh, a, a, a positive injection to, uh, correct some, uh, uh, some, uh, mistaken thinking and, uh, uh, bring clarity into some lives. So, yeah, so we will, uh, be back tomorrow. Forgive me. Yes, I had a long weekend working, lots of shifts, lots of drama, lots of problems out there. And, uh, yeah, I'm thankful that Hashem, uh, you know, has been with and uh, all goes well. We're going to sign up for today for Rocky Mountain Readings, but please come back and join us tomorrow. We're going to continue in the wonderful work, the Gaona Vilna and his Messianic Vision, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, but the author, uh, has a, a definitive plan, uh, a scholar for sure. And, uh, it's nice to hear of the depth in, uh, in history and, uh, learn from our mistakes. So till tomorrow, folks have a wonderful, wonderful day.